Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and we're going to talk about managed and unmanaged switches and layer three networking when you need these different components in your network. And part of it has to do, of course, with scale, but there's a little bit more details that we want to dive into on this. If you want to learn more about me or my company, head over to lawrencesystems.com. If you'd like to hire us for a project, there's a hire us button at the top of our website. If you want to participate in our forums and reach out and just have a say hi to us, that's a great place to do it. And below, if you want to support the channel in other ways, are lots of links to different affiliate products and affiliate services. Um, they give you a lot of discounts too, and it'd be appreciative if you want to click on any of those if you see something you like. So networking. Start off with flat networks, which is this crappy old D-Link box. And uh, you know this is probably still lots of these floating around in people's houses undoubtedly. Uh, internet comes in, it's an integrated switch, wireless routing all in one box and starts your most basic level of networking. Right away, people start wanting to upgrade and get something a little bit better but this doesn't offer any type of network segmentation and this will be our flat network example. And we'll only be spending a very brief amount of time on that, don't worry. This represents a more complex network of even multiple switches here of different brands and a PFSense firewall. So I do a lot of videos on this topic and I wanted to have some reference for when I say, you know, this type of switch or VLAN and things like that. And just a basic explainer video so you have something to reference or I have something to reference and reply to people asking about, well, do I need a layer three switch? You said that one supports VLANs but doesn't support layer three. What does that mean? So we're going to make some assumptions and this is the layout I'm about to show you that's all going to be done in diagrams, but I figured, hey, let's talk about the physical part. We are going to be assigning two different VLAN IDs plus a native off of one physical port. And that's the idea of virtual LANs, is you encapsulate multiple virtual networks inside of one physical cable. This is done because you may have a physical cable that goes from here to the other side of my building, and then there's a, more computers over there, and I need different types of traffic to get over there for different networks. Maybe you have a network for accounting, a network for design, etc., and you don't want them on the same network, or you have your IoT network that's separate, and you don't want that on there, and especially in the industrial world, we see industrial controllers that we need separated on different networks, but we only have one, what we may refer to as a backhaul line that gets to the back of the factory where that side of it is, and we don't have well, the customer didn't really want to run all individual lines. VLANs help facilitate that. They're actually a very efficient way to use a single cable, but that does require managed switches to do. That's where we're going to start. So we have this one port coming in and this is going to have all, and then it's going to go to a this uh, edge switch, which does support VLANs and such, but does not support layer three routing. Then we have this MikroTik switch, which does support uh, both VLANs and layer three routing. So these are just some examples. We're not gonna dive deep into it. This is more of an overview. Uh, so you understand how they work, not necessarily how you set up inner VLAN routing on a MikroTik. So let's look at the diagrams here and start breaking things down. Now this is the basic flat unmanaged network with an unmanaged switch. Unmanaged switch, like its namesake, it means there's nothing you really have to do to the switch. Everything you plug into it just starts talking to everything else that's plugged into it. There's nothing else that really needs to be done. They don't need to be configured out of the box. They just make these two boxes talk to each other. So we have 192.168.3.9 and 3.10 in the unmanaged switch. They can easily ping and talk to each other. And if they can't find something on the uh, 3.0/24 network here, it routes out to the internet and a router firewall takes care of it from there. Really basic, really simple. This is how a lot of people's home networks are set up. And then you know, although this switch and firewall are all integrated in a D-Link, essentially that's what the D-Link's doing behind the scenes. There's not really any management on the switch side of it. When we get to something a little bit more extensive, we have this here. So the native VLAN ID tag of one, so the base without any VLANs is gonna be 192.168.3.1. And this is our router firewall represented at the beginning of the video, like I said, with a PFSense firewall, just for example. And it's going to be passing with a single cable, all the traffic over to manage switch one, which manage switch one is gonna to talk to manage switch two and pass all the traffic, all the VLANs, everything across, and manage switch two to manage switch three, all the traffic, all the VLANs all across. So um, anything I define in here, and as long as I've programmed these switches to define VLAN 1337 and VLAN 69, they will carry all the traffic over. Someone may like to point out that some unmanaged switches will not parse, but pass 
VLAN traffic. The difference is some do, some don't. I don't have a list of them, but someone may point out that you could put an unmanaged switch sometimes in between. And as long as it forwards and doesn't strip any of the traffic out of that VLAN, yes, it will forward it, but an unmanaged switch is not ideal. And many times when I'm doing troubleshooting for people, finding one of these in the mix of here where someone thought to plug one in because they thought they were being helpful uh, causes confusion because you'll just have missing VLANs down here. It'll only forward VLAN one traffic because that's all it was designed to do. But occasionally, maybe it's because of the chipset they use, it will forward some of the other traffic. But I'm not going to dive deep into that, just a little note and something of note. So when these devices, we have VLAN ID 69, 172.16.69.1, network slash 24. This is, these are the assignments that the router would have as its LAN IP, if you will, and each one of these LANs. So VLAN ID of 1337 has 10.13.37.1 slash 24. So Things on the slash 24 means it can talk to anything as long as that last octet right here is 1 to 254. It's able to talk to any of those devices. So, well, one being the router, so you can't reuse that one. But you get the idea. This means that's going to be on that subnet. So now here we have VLAN ID 69. So it's defined up here. We've programmed our switches, and I have a port, and we assign it to VLAN 69, and it's given this box 172.16.69.22. Also plugged into this switch is VLAN ID 69, 172, They're neighbors, plugged in the same switch. So when these two devices want to talk to each other, they just go through the switch. That's sim that simple. They get whatever the full speed of the switch is. So let's assume this is a gigabit switch. They can talk to each other at gigabit, no problem, because they're on the same switch segment. What about this one over here? Well, it can talk to it too, but when VLAN ID 69 is pulled off of main switch, and there's a switch in between, and then this switch, this is going to go, let's say we had a packet originating from here. It's going to go from here to here to here, then over to here. So now sharing the bandwidth, assuming there's one wire between switch with any of the other traffic that's traversing across here. Same thing with this VLAN ID 1337, 10, 13, 37, 66, plugged into manage switch here. You can talk to this one, but it's got to traverse all of these. Now, what about this guy here? 192.168.3.9. How does it handle its routing? if it wanted to get over to VLAN ID 69 or over to this. Well, because this isn't a local segment, it's got to go from 192.168.3.9 all the way over here. Actually, I just realized I have a typo. This has to be a different IP address, just in case someone calls me out on it. It has to go from here, 192.168.3.9 through manage switch 3, 2, 1, all the way up here to the firewall, which hands off a rule because it says, okay, you're looking for the VLAN 69 network. Then it redirects or to switch one, which says, nope, I don't have it. Nope, I don't have it. I don't have it, but you want to get here. So in order for this to work, it's going through here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, back over here. So you can see there's a lot of traversal going on. It happens really fast. It's going to happen at the line speed, but if each of these is also doing things that also have to traverse all these switches, you can start to end up with a bit of a problem where congestion happens. You've just got so much traffic going through all these switches. Now, someone may point out, why isn't this more in a star design? Why are you showing switches across? Isn't normally one core switch and then everything kind of goes out in a wheel spoke, hub spoke? style. Well, yes, but the real world sometimes doesn't let you do that. Ideally, if you had your ability to design it and it was going to be implemented that way, yes, that's the most ideal. So you're always trying to reduce the number of switches in between. That is always the goal. Sometimes it's just not as feasible when you're running wires or the way the buildings are laid out uh, when you're setting things up. But this is where layer three switching kicks in. So layer three switching would allow us to go from right here to right here. This would have to be a layer three capable switch. But that also means a couple other things. You have to build the rule sets for that. Maybe you want it just to automatically connect the two subnets together, no problem. That's something very common with layer switches. What if you had specific rules that I only needed a very specific machine uh, to talk to a very specific other machine on this network, but not all of them. So now I have some really specific pack or packet filtering rules that are gonna go in between as well. Well, in that case, that's nice, but it becomes another platform you have to manage. So this is one of the reasons you'll see people settle on a single platform and try to really keep it that way with all their switches, because they'll build these rules, they'll copy and paste them between all the different switches, uh, uploading the same config, so they're very uniformly done. 
or whatever platform they're using may have a management platform that allows them to see all the rules. Because this sometimes has created problems when we've gone out and helped companies with networks that we didn't have passwords to and had to start reverse engineering things because we don't have any information about the network from the people who set it up originally. And you'll find that you're like, well, it seems like this should route this way, but every time someone tries to get out of a network, it just goes somewhere else. That's because of the routing rules that are defined in here. This is something that when you're scoping out or re-engineering and taking over networks, you have to make sure all these rules aren't there or you'll say, hey, I think I secured and separated your two separate networks. And next thing you know, two different networks can talk to each other because of some rule in some switch somewhere. So it does create a little bit more complexity in terms of management, but in the situation where I want these things to talk to each other without hopping back through each time, it's definitely a really good thing to have when you want the layer three. Let's talk about this Mikrotik CRS305 one gig for us in one review, four port must have 10 gig switch. I agree, Serve the Home did a great article. They dive deep on the topic of the switch. I just did a review of it myself. And it does support layer three. This though, is one of the things. At this $130 price performance, which I agree with them completely, is a great buy if you need 10 gigs. But as you can see, as you start to add features like IP filters and small packet sizes, the switch goes to sub one gig speeds. So this is an important aspect of when you're thinking about this, that can the device, the layer three device you're looking at handle the speeds? So it's not just a matter now, one more, one more piece to the equation when you're trying to buy a switch is, hey, this switch does 10 gig between ports. That means it should route at 10 gig. That is different. It doesn't necessarily do that. So when you're trying to decide when you're doing a larger scale infrastructure network, you then have to dive deeper into the capabilities to switch. And maybe that's fine because you only need a little bit of traffic, like a printer. I need a printer and I need the routing on these so the printer hops don't go all the way through the switches. Printers are generally low bandwidth devices. You can put them on a separate network. You can create very specific rules for them. And I'm okay if printers have a lower bandwidth, depending on the print volume, of course, but generally speaking, printers aren't something high bandwidth. Same with some of your miscellany small IoT devices. Maybe you want a limited amount of access across the VLANs and inner VLAN routing would maybe work for that where you have a very specific rule, but they're low bandwidth because it just needs to send something, a few packets over to kick something off, like turn on a light. So just one more piece in the equation. So do you need a layer three switch? Not that often until you start getting into the larger network with multiple hops on there um, because of the other challenges. And once you go into a higher end layer three switch, because like I said, once you offload some of the packet filtering stuff on there, it has to be fast enough to do it or you didn't really move the bar and accomplish what you wanted to do of solving the hops problem and solving the bandwidth. You just moved where the problem is. Um, it's really dependent on your network needs. Now, I encourage always people with the home labs and going who I really need this. Um, go ahead and buy it. It's a great way to learn. It's a great way to start plugging in because there's a lot to setting up a layer three switch. For example, you know, it goes out of scope of this talk, but routing rules that have to be in to pass off the routes because just because you put the layer three rules in here, you have to make sure the devices have the proper routing tables to make sure they understand how to get there. And there's a whole different um, level of steps required to do that. It's not something that's, like I said, undoable. I don't want to make these things sound insurmountable, but they're all the considerations you have to have when you're building these out. So hopefully this clears up the layer three question that I get a lot. Um, does it do layer three? And that's where even things like this edge switch become kind of a, do, not every edge switch does layer three. And then Unify, I've covered numerous of their switches. And I know the new line doesn't have it yet, but are supposed to be getting some layer three functionality on their pro series of the new Unify Gen 2 pro series. So I'll be doing more videos on that. Um, I don't have that many, actually, I don't think I have any current layer three demos for any of the edge switches, but also do note, not every edge switch such as this one here, the edge switch 10X even has that capability. Um, so something to consider, something to think about. And thank you. Um, continue the discussion over on the forums and or leave some comments. And I try to reply to all of them on here, but I definitely reply to them on the forums. Thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos, they're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. 
Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.